Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, the second day of BSD CAN. As I recognize that this is the second day, and as I look around and see a room full of people who, while excited enough about this talk to be here, are maybe a little bit uh, groggy, let's say, from a full day of conference already, and from uh, you know a lot of people staying up late last night, of course, in the Hacker Lounge, doing productive work and all that. I uh, nevertheless am uh, compelled to do something that I would, uh, that I often do in the classroom with my first thing in the morning classes, and that's just very simple, to ask all of you to stand up and just say hello to one person next to you. <laughs> get a little blood flowing. We need to get that energy in the room. <laughs> Thank you for helping me yesterday, by the way, David. <laughs> okay. Okay. No, no problem. Okay. I, I'll go with you to do that. Seventh floor. All right, uh, thank you for that, everybody. Now I can see, see, you're already smiling just a little bit more. This is magnificent. Well, let's begin then. <laughs> Hello, everyone, again. My name is Corey Steffen, Dr. Corey Steffen. I currently serve as Assistant Professor of Theology, and yes, you heard that, Theology, and Fellow of the Corps at the University of St. Thomas in Houston, Texas. My academic background is in Catholic historical theology, and my current appointment is inside a new department dedicated to scholarship and andragogy, teaching adults, in the traditional liberal arts, building a neoclassical undergraduate curriculum. This talk is titled, as I've written on the whiteboard for you, Summa Tetradondite, that is Summa of the Pufferfish, as a play on the, name, on the names of the countless Summe projects of the late Latin Middle Ages, especially the famous Summa Theologiae of Thomas Aquinas, my university's namesake. While I was in the early stages of drafting this talk a few weeks ago, I did what anybody at BSD can would do, and I ventured into IRC to ask a couple of people there uh, for some ideas. And um, a witty chap in IRC suggested that I ought to retitle this talk to Summa Theologiae as an homage to both Thomas Aquinas's most famous project and, of course, Mr. Theodorat, the founder and leader of the OpenBSD project. Whether Summa Tetrodondite or Summa Theologiae is the better title for this talk, its subtitle, Thomas Aquinas Explores OpenBSD's Medieval Orderliness, will remain in place since it sets the stage for the fresh way of looking at OpenBSD that I aim to provide here by way of an old, quite old, worldview. I will explore and imagine Thomas Aquinas exploring how the internal hierarchy and hygiene of OpenBSD and or the orderly and therefore intelligible desktop operating system par excellence might be understood as aligning with the worldview of an, or the, late 13th century Aristotelian philosopher and Christian theologian, par excellence. This talk, then, will be about the nexus between two seemingly wholly unrelated realms of excellence. In my FreeBSD Friday lecture, FreeBSD for the Writing Scholar, I focused on the craft of scholarship, studying and writing toward academic publication, inside FreeBSD. In my talk here at BSD CAN last year, BSD for Researching, Writing, and Teaching in the Liberal Arts, I considered both FreeBSD and OpenBSD as professional tools for teaching and learning. Here, I will revisit a small amount of the territory of both of those talks while largely pivoting in order to tackle the challenge that I set for myself in my BSD CAN 2023 conference report that was published in the free pre BSD journal, namely, to quote myself, to return to interact with everyone that I met at BSD 2023 again at BSD CAN 2024, and to present something even more daring. 
as I hope that my record demonstrates, I cherish each Berkeley software distribution derived operating system in its own way. In this particular talk, although much of what I say is likely to be applicable to other BSDs, I happen to focus on OpenBSD. By delivering BSD-based creative educational talks of this kind, I hope to inspire fellow academics to become Unix geeks while showing you, the BSD project's contributors and leaders, that your labors yield fruits beyond the business scenarios that tend to dominate our normal discussion zones, including conferences like this one. I also hope to provide everyone who listens with something, well, fun. <laughs> I aim to be half serious and half tongue in cheek, teaching and explaining while encouraging and yes, jesting. For the folks at home who are listening to a recording of this lecture, that would be there. <laughs> Whether you are a newcomer to Unix who might like uh, to learn some, uh, about using a BSD operating system so that you can always know what is happening at your workstation, a BSD hacker who would not mind receiving a metaphorical pat on the back for the hard work that you do, or a persnickety geek like me who demands internal consistency from his operating system. I hope that you will appreciate something from what I am about to share. And back to you who are here at BSD CAN 2024, cheers, and thank you for giving me a topic worthy of discussion. This talk is ultimately for you in more ways than one. The late 13th century Italian Dominican friar and priest Thomas Aquinas is known for many things and by many titles. For us Catholic theologians, he has the almost unthinkably lofty distinction of carrying not one, not two, but three separate titles of doctor bestowed posthumously by popes, formal recognitions of his high authority as our ecclesial teacher which is what the Latin word doctor carried into English as doctor means. Every doctor is indeed a teacher. Thomas is lauded as the doctor angelicus, the angelic doctor for his teaching on angels, doctor humanitatis, doctor of humanity or humaneness for his teachings on what it means to be human as such, doctor communis, common doctor for the universal reception and value of his teachings writ large. Thomas was a widely respected philosopher and theologian even in his own day, known for his subtlety of thought in which he exhaustively examined every angle that he and his associates could for any given problem, carefully weighing multiple positions while drawing conclusions from argumentation in an especially refined form of the scholastic style that ran through Europe's universities. All of that subtlety, consideration, and refinement is traditionally praised as peaking, so to speak, in Thomas's most famous written work, which is certainly the most famous writing of the latter half of the 13th century from Europe, if not the whole world, namely the Summa Theologiae. Thomas's summary of theology spans thousands of pages, even in the smallest modern typeset printings that require squinting or the use of magnifying glasses to read comfortably. Its title then, The Summary of Theology, provides no shortage of amusement to my colleagues who study it day in and day out. Thomas really meant the work to be a comprehensive guide into the academic study of the Christian faith tradition that even a novice with only modest Latin reading skills and basic philosophical vocabulary could digest. In the 21st century, however, whether because Thomas was simply overly optimistic about what novices actually can accomplish, because we have culturally shifted away from the collective church life that Thomas took for granted among his pupils, being as we are a quite secularized society in the 21st century West, or even simply because we have stunted attention spans. Let's be frank, smartphones, right? If not some of all of the above. The study of significant portions of the Summa Theologiae is generally relegated to advanced university classes, dissertation projects, and contexts of the kind. I contend, however, that anybody of reasonable intelligence can be guided into Thomas's modus operandi in the Summa Theologiae and without too much work. And that 
having been guided into Thomas's modus operandi, anybody who wishes to learn what the Summa Theologiae contains may in fact do so. The same, I contend, is true about OpenBSD. Contrary to some rumors, often based on outdated information, OpenBSD is at this particular moment in time, perhaps the single easiest operating system for a newcomer with some basic Unix-like operating system familiarity and, yes, reasonable intelligence to learn to use. Now, if Mr. Michael Lucas were in the room, you know where this is going, right? I would have to be careful when defining reasonable intelligence. Yet he and the other members of the scheduling committee have chosen to slot his talk at the same time as mine, so I am at liberty to leave this joke at our dear friend's expense in place while praising all of you in this room as in fact persons of reasonable intelligence. It is time then for you who came for a technical conference about modern computers to enter into a medieval mode of philosophical argumentation. Thomas planned the Summa Theologiae with what can only be described as a tremendously orderly structure. There is a grand plan for the whole work, which Thomas wrote in three main partes, parts, with the second having two halves. Inside each of those three parts, there is a logical flow of questiones, large-scale questions. Inside each large question, there is an internal, internal logical flow of articuli, articles. The article, then, is Thomas's smallest argumentative unit. In each article, Thomas proceeds like this. First, he asks a particular small-scale question. Then he lists possible answers to the question, which he calls objecciones, objections. Then opening with the phrase said contra, but against he provides an authoritative quotation that points toward his own answer. Then he provides his own answer, which he introduces with the word respondeo, I respond. Finally, he revisits each of the objections, which remember are serious possible answers, in turn explaining the faults with or otherwise, or otherwise providing a clarification or corrective to each with a responsum ad objectum, response to the objection. Now, I know what you're thinking. Oh, but Stefan, all of this is entirely abstract. All right, let's get into an example, an example about OpenBSD. A silly one, but an example nevertheless. If Thomas were alive today and were to decide to write a commentary on the glorious OpenBSD Frequently Asked Questions webpage, really a handbook, at openbsd.org backslash FAQ, he might have one of his grand questions in the setup section be, how should a system administrator manage a server's users? One of the first articles inside that question might open with the sub-question, who should have root access? The first objection in this meeting place of late 13th century Italy with early 21st century Canada might read like so. To begin, it seems that everyone who works on the IT team of a company should have root access to a server, since root access is essential to perform many common workday tasks. The second objection then might be, moreover, in absolute OpenBSD second edition, Michael Lucas writes, quote, in recent years, there has been a trend toward using the privileged root account for everyday tasks on systems that have only a single user. Now, the reason for this trend is that many quotidian Unix tasks in our enlightened era require elevated privileges that were not required in the days of pocket protectors, mainframes, and tape decks. Accordingly, it is good to hand out root access to as many persons as might need to do any sort of tasks, tasks with any sort of privilege elevation. Hold your tomatoes, folks. We're considering the objections. The said contra, that is, authoritative quotation to the contrary of the objections that points toward Thomas's own answer, might read like this. Said contra, but against, at the start of chapter six, root management in absolute OpenBSD second edition, Lucas provides the following haiku. This one can log in. This other can get email. Never give out root. Next, Thomas would enter into his own response. Respondeo, 
I respond that only the top administrators or even only one top administrator needs access, root access on a server. Finally, Thomas would revisit each of the objections in turn. Ad primum, to the first objection, that everyone who works on the IT team of a company should have root access to a server. Since root access is essential to perform many common workday tasks, it is uh, to be said that OpenBSD provides a sophisticated system of assigning permissions for specific tasks to both user groups and individual users. So assigning wholesale administrative power to any individual other than the person or persons who strictly require that power is unnecessary. To the second objection that it is good to hand out root access to as many persons as there are who might need to do any sort of tasks with any sort of privilege elevation, it is worth repeating an axiom that Lucas advances later in the same chapter of Absolute OpenBSD that was quoted in the second objection. Perform all tasks with the minimum level of privilege necessary. If you don't need root access to perform a task, don't use it. Lucas's axiom applies equally to all privilege allocations in all Unix-like operating systems. Now, obviously, this was a silly example in which I meant to make you Unix-savvy listeners squirm while keeping matters obvious. Nobody at a BSD conference, administrator of corporate servers or not, ever would dream of adding an office assistant to the wheel group or writing a root password on a post-it note for a baby-faced new IT department hire. I hope, however, that in its goofy simplicity, you started to learn something about how Thomas and his colleagues argued. It was different from how we, modern persons, typically argue. Rather than being loud, circuitous, and disinterested in genuine consideration of counterarguments. Anybody turn on C-SPAN lately? It is collected, orderly, and takes seriously every possible answer within the realm of reason. Wait, systematic, predictable, orderly, and frequently debated in good faith toward that very systematic, predictable orderliness? Well, that sounds like the OpenBSD project. We modern persons, influenced by postmodernism, whether we wish to be or not, tend to see the happenings of the universe as merely random. Every context for our lives is a patchwork of randomness. Thomas, like other high scholastics, that is schoolmen of the 13th century in the Latin West, saw reality in what can only be described as an, if not the, opposite way. They saw all of the happenings of the universe as fitting within an absolutely radically logical divine plan. They saw part of that plan as a strict cosmic hierarchy of being with God at the top, then angels, then humans, then animals, then plants, all the way down the line of creation to Michael Lucas. Since Thomas and his peers understood everything that comes to pass and everything that exists as having its own rightful intentional place, never as merely random. They constructed their own writings and arguments with the same sort of attention to planning and order, giving everything that they wrote and said in formal contexts its own rightful, intentional place. I'm not here to tell you whether either of these approaches or something else entirely is right or wrong, although you might rightly guess that I side with Thomas on this one in believing in cosmic order. I am here today, however, to draw you into thinking about a curious high-level similarity between the worldview of Thomas and his peers on the one hand and the computing view of folks in the OpenBSD realm on the other hand. And of course, I'll welcome questions, comments, and hallway discussion to see if I got it right at the end of it all. It might be said, at least here among BSD land friends, that the GNU Linux way of things is not unlike the quintessentially modern worldview. Piece things together, grab a bit from here, another bit from there, and a random bit from another place, and trust that it all will come together to form some sort of workable whole collection as the very animating force or life-giving part of a computer that is the operating system itself. In fairness, this does largely work in some contexts, especially among the major players. And I say this while thinking of the likes of Debian, on which I personally depend for a lot of my regular work. 
At the same time, the OpenBSD way of things is not unlike that of Thomas and his peers. To venture into this analogy, I'm again going to draw from the introduction to Lucas's Absolute OpenBSD, second edition. I think that it is best to start with three somewhat polemical, definitely edgy lines from Lucas. But these are his lines, so blame him, not me. First, Lucas writes, OpenBSD is perhaps the freest of the free operating systems. Since he explains, quote, the OpenBSD idea of freedom in contradistinction, contradistinction to that in some other free and or open source software projects is that its code can be used for any purpose by anyone and the OpenBSD team works hard to ensure that every line of code it supports is licensed with full openness. Second, he writes, OpenBSD developers make it a strict rule to write programs in a reliable and secure manner following best current programming practices. Third, in OpenBSD, Lucas writes, documentation errors are considered serious bugs and are treated as harshly as any other serious bugs. Since the OpenBSD community expects the documentation to be both complete and accurate. With these three interrelated ideas in mind, one can say that the OpenBSD team has been committed for nearly 30 years to an orderly plan, which has been meticulously applied throughout the entirety of the operating system. There will be character giving odds and ends, and even places of irony, such as the fact that code under a different license, the GNU public license is used specifically as CVS and probably Git via GOT soon to organize OpenBSD's own source code. Yet the orderly plan remains the driving force behind and inside the OpenBSD project. Rather like how in the medieval scholastic worldview, God and God's plan constituted the driving force behind and inside what a person saw as the eternal project. Part of the OpenBSD project's orderliness comes from its plain hierarchy. Highly regimented, centrally controlled systems are efficient. That is one of their great strengths. In the minds of Thomas and his Latin scholastic peers, I say again, there was an unbreakable pecking order to the universe. God, then angels, then humans, then all lesser creatures. All that happened fit underneath the dominion of God. The opportunity is ripe for another pun here with the OpenBSD project leader's name. Would that he were here to hear this. Theo, which of course means a or the God. With this one God, as it were, this one Theo, having final say in what happens in the project, rather than relying on some sort of democratic or other final judgment process, and having him be its chief director ensures that the project continues on a clear trajectory. That trajectory might be understood as a kind of providential plan, as it were, in which the three core uh, project principles toward which I gestured a moment ago may flourish, each principle only being compromised in the rarest of circumstances with the overall movement of the project being one of pure commitment. Those three principles are, again, commitment to openness, attention to code correctness and security, and consistency in documentation. If ever there were an observation that did not surprise Unix graybeards, this would be it. Even the quickest of glances at the mailing list archives reveals that fights among OpenBSD folks happen all the time. Not only among us users, the lesser beings in the project's hierarchy, but even among those who we might call the angels, the committers who are credited by name in each set of release notes. I'm trying to score brownie points, okay? Yet disagreements are understood to have come to an end, at least in their functional utility, when Theo has passed final judgment. As Lucas writes in Absolute OpenBSD, Theo might have a big stick, but as he is the acknowledged project leader, he doesn't need to use it nearly as often as you might think. For any newcomer to OpenBSD, the interworking of the three orderly parts of the OpenBSD project that I have outlined here probably first becomes apparent during 
installation. And so here, I think back to Mr. Andrew's talk from yesterday. After booting to an installation medium, choosing the option of I for install initiates the solitary user who has at least a modicum of familiarity with operating systems with a sane series of default choices. Keyboard layout, host name, network interface configuration, root password, SSH setup, Xenocara and XenoDM for the X window system, serial console setup, additional user setup, time zone configuration, disk layout selection, disk, disk encryption, mirror selection, and graphics and other driver and firmware installation all happen in series with intelligible secure defaults that just work. Many newcomers will not even need to consult the frequently asked questions web page in order to complete the installation since the installer is basically self-contained and self-explanatory. Let's give a little applause to Mr. Andrew. <laughs> Since a sensible installation involves tapping the enter key to accept a default uh, at most, if, uh, to accept a default at most, uh, the whole installation, including downloading all the OpenBSD file uh, sets during the installation process, takes about 10 minutes nowadays. 15 if I ought to include first downloading the floppy disk compatible five megabyte mini root image and writing it to a flash drive with a tool like DD. Anecdotally, installing OpenBSD onto supported hardware is the simplest process that I've experienced with any operating system, beating everything from Microsoft Windows and Apple Mac OS. Obviously, you can't even install Mac OS on something without hacking it. To every major GNU Linux distribution, and even if I might be allowed to hazard one contrast here with other BSDs, the other operating systems being discussed at this conference. With OpenBSD, everything needed for a default sensible installation happens in a minim minimalist, secure by default, and automatic way. For a newcomer to OpenBSD who is accustomed to reading Thomas's Summa Theologiae or other typically scholastic medieval written works, the step-by-step -step intelligibility of the OpenBSD installer should come across as familiar, greeting the person performing the installation with a transparent logical flow that feels Medieval in the best way possible. Opening the BSD FAQ, the newcomer will be greeted with the same sort of point-to-point -point logical flow. The purpose of the FAQ is not unlike that of Thomas's Summa Theologiae in that it is, it is an encyclopedic set of articles with an easy-to-follow system of finding answers to nearly every question that someone only just seeking initiation into the subject might have. It opens with key matters for getting started, such as a brief explanation of what OpenBSD actually is. It continues with an installation guide. After giving an installation guide, it provides explanations and sequence for system management, how to install third-party software, which is extremely simple nowadays, thanks to package ad related tools. Technical, but not so horrible, even for a newbie, things about source code compilation, disk formatting, input and output device management, OpenBSD Xenocara, operating system virtualization, VPN setup and or installation, and of course, the packet filter. The many contributors to the FAQ have done all of this in plain language that requires only a general familiarity with Unix-like matters to actually understand. This plain spokenness requiring only a minimum of jargon is itself of a kind with Thomas's formidable Summa Theologiae, which I say again, reaches our eyes and ears in the contemporary world as painfully esoteric, but was actually first penned for initiates. Each generation will have a set of initiates into a thing be it traditional Christian theology or a proactively secure Unix-like operating system that already knows the basic language required to learn about that thing. Now, I could move to discuss OpenBSD's utterly clean manual pages a part of that important idea of having clean documentation, which even I, a theologian, have no trouble understanding. Or I could pivot to some specific, specific aspect of OpenBSD's 
organizational structure, such as just how clean its Etsy slash RC.conf really is, or I could discuss how the source code is documented via comments with such straightforward completeness that yes, even the persnickety Thomas and other medieval Latin scholastics probably would appreciate it, but, but somebody in IRC, actually a different person from the one who suggested making a pun of Theo's name, wrote to me that it would be intriguing to examine a particular part of the OpenBSD project that seems to rub against, or at least interact non-intuitively with, its orderliness. Namely, the well-known extent to which Theo and others are committed to strict correctness and security, even when strict correctness and security require moving or adding things that can cause breakages. Most recently, starting early in the 7.4 current cycle and accumulating with 7.5 release, at least some of us were hit by Theo's removal of certain kinds of system call access, which has notably, among other things, broken software written in the Go language. As a longtime user of the micro text editor, which is written in Go, I am now without my favorite text editor on OpenBSD, which, as all of you know, is a rather dire situation for a Unix geek. Being without your favorite text editor, oh boy. What does that sort of feature breaking change in the name of correctness and security, the kind of dramatic change that has been made repeatedly through OpenBSD's 29 years, have to do with orderliness? Given the room that this present, presents to us for debate, this seems like a fitting opportunity to return to another SUMA-like article. To open the article, our imaginary 21st century Thomas Aquinas, the Unix geek, asks, does the fact that the OpenBSD project's leaders sometimes remove, add, or change things to the point of functional disruption in the name of correctness lessen the project's orderliness? For the first objection, it seems that the OpenBSD project's orderliness is reduced by the project leader's full willingness to cause functional disruption in the name of cor correctness, since functional disruption is inherently disorderly. As Gandalf the Grey reports at the Council of Elrond in J.R.R. Tolkien's The Fellowship of the Ring, that he said to Saruman upon learning of his treachery, he who breaks a thing to find out what it is has left the path of wisdom. The same principle applies not only to uncovering what things are, but also to applying fixes to them. What the wizard said to the fallen member of his order then could be communicated equally, equally in this way. He who breaks a thing to fi fix it has left the path of wisdom. He who breaks a thing to fix it. Leaving the path of wisdom in turn happens because the person has left the orderliness that is due in fixing a thing. Second, for the second objection, it is apparent that functional disruption harms the professional workflows that OpenBSD is supposed to help. Slowing systems by disabling simultaneous multiprocessing by default in the name of security, cutting the Bluetooth stack out of the operating system entirely, breaking compatibility with legacy or otherwise quirked third-party software by implementing new major security enhancements and other decisions of the kind that rupture the order and so uh, they rupture the order and so orderliness of OpenBSD's actual use cases, which in turn means that the orderliness of OpenBSD itself is lessened by them, if not ruptured. Said a contra, but against. Theodore Ratt said in a 2006 interview about the OpenBSD project, quote, other vendors are not treating their source code the way that we treat ours, with distrust, knowing that we should always actively churn it so that it can slowly evolve into a better state." End quote. He has said many other things of this kind. Respondeo, I imagined Thomas Aquinas, the Unix geek, respond that, the fact that the OpenBSD project's projects leaders occasionally remove or change things to the point of causing functional disruption in the name of correctness does not lessen the projects orderliness. As a person living a well-ordered life, 
both systematically removes harmful and broken things from her life and proactively builds helpful, healthy habits that preclude negative habits. And as a as well-ordered societies, uh, and as a well-ordered society's members, both systematically remove harmful and broken things from the society and proactively build helpful, healthy societal elements that preclude negative elements, so too does a well-ordered computer operating system require both systematic removal of harmful and broken elements and proactive construction of healthy, helpful elements. The allowance or disallowance of continuity with the past has nothing to do with correctness as such. To the first objection that functional disruption is inherently disorderly, it is to be said that what is inherently disorderly is not merely causing disruption, but rather causing disruption for disruption's own sake. When disruption happens as a consequence of some necessary change, such as part of removing a harmful or broken part of the OpenBSD system, or proactively building a more secure part, a framework or, or, or a, a, a piece of machinery, as we hear folks often say, of the OpenBSD system, then the disruption is not only not disorderly, but rather orderly. Gandalf does say, he who breaks a thing to find out what it is has left the path of wisdom. But this line pertains to discovery, not improvement. Some decades earlier, in the context of Tolkien's The Hobbit, Gandalf himself said, It is the small everyday deeds of ordinary folk that keep the darkness at bay. Sometimes deeds meant to keep the darkness at bay will cause disruption, even for the folks performing the deeds themselves. Losing the micro text editor be because the Go language depends on kinds of system calls that the OpenBSD project leaders deem insecure is actually a small price to pay for the good that is, yes, somehow even greater than having one's preferred text editor of having proactive kernel security. To the second objection that rupturing the order and so orderliness of OpenBSD's actual use cases is the same as rupturing the orderliness of OpenBSD itself, two things are to be said. First, the OpenBSD project, while only useful in as much as it is usable, is nevertheless its own project for which its leaders have their own prerogatives. Every edge case cannot be preserved as part of building the whole correctly. Second, the lion's share of functional disruptions come from third-party software, not OpenBSD itself. When the operating system is more orderly than the third-party software that one wishes to use on it so that third-party software does not work, it is not the fault of the operating system's team. Sometimes this conflict is because the third-party software has objective security or other flaws. Other times it is a matter of a design difference that is in itself neither good nor bad. Now, some of you might have seen this coming, but I would like to direct your attention to this now vintage OpenBSD t-shirt that I have. New, old stock, from OpenBSD 3.5 release uh, in 2004. It is about CARP, OpenBSD's uh, then novel common address redundancy protocol that was precisely one of the OpenBSD project's orderly additions, the first of its kind among free and open source software projects that the operating system carries to this day. This artwork shows heaven as the secured intranet. Up here, there's a little uh, caption that says secured intranet for heaven. And hell as the insecure internet. Puff one and puff two, two puffer fish, are security angels who co cooperate with carp angels who look like, well, carps, and the packet filter system to determine whether a particular fish is allowed to escape hell and enter heaven or not. 
there is some sort of sea monster dangling from the clouds up here. And I've tried asking about this around the conference. Nobody knew, knows exactly what the sea monster is. So if you know, shout it out now, please. <laughs> Uh, who I assume, I assume the sea monster is supposed to be a stand-in for God, since the monster seems to have control of PFSync and really the whole package vetting uh, system. The process is depicted as a cyclical pattern in which one may uh, trust reliably that only the good may enter through the packet filter's gates into the heavenly intranet. Cheeky though this shirt may be, its design can nevertheless point us back to the basic idea that I shared earlier about Thomas Aquinas and his 13th century Latin scholastic peers. Namely, that they saw the happenings of the universe as fitting inside an absolutely logical divine plan. Part of that plan is that the happenings of the universe are ordered, often cyclically, the idea of an eventual literal divine judgment, the very thing that this lovely cartoon imitates, was entirely real in their minds and hearts. That judgment, they believed, would be according to the righteousness of the souls being judged, and they believed that nothing will be out of place in the making of that judgment, for the orderly fulfillment of the plan is absolute. The three core principles of the OpenBSD project that I've repeated in this talk, commitment to openness and freedom, attention to code correctness and proactive security, and consistency in documentation, coalesce around an orderly plan for the OpenBSD project to be done the right way, whose own fulfillment, while not absolute, is in a way guaranteed by OpenD, OpenBSD's internal review process to such a degree that the user of OpenBSD can trust the operating system to be set up sensibly for serious work by default. Now, I want to thank everyone in this room for listening. I have just a couple quick closing things. If you might like to learn about how I set up OpenBSD to assist my scholarly, scholarly work, I have a detailed long blog post about that on my website at coreystefan.com backslash openbsd hyphen thinkpad. So you can just go to uh, coreystefan.com, click blog, and it's right there. In that post, I explain how to set up OpenBSD for regular, uh, uh, let's say, non-hacker desktop usage with a tiling window man manager on a trusty thinkpad before walking through the main software packages that I use. Uh, among those tools are academic writing and citation management programs, namely the LaTeX editors TechMaker and Killa, and the BibTech manager KBibTech, the latter two of which, both KDE projects, Mr. Rafael Sadowski has made available with clean ports for us. In fact, he most generously ported KBibTech at my written requests with explanation for me that KBibTech is actually meant to be paired with Killa as a coherent uh, pairing of professional software tools. Now, uh, for a final note, as something of a cheerful aside, the team behind, um, and this exists, this might be new for some of you folks, the team behind Aprendiendo de Jesus, a distribution of OpenBSD to promote the construction of the kingdom of God from education and respect for human dignity, translated from Spanish, has made solid ports of a variety of tools that are actually specifically relevant to the craft of academic theology, uh, as well as uh, history and philosophy. These include, among other things, the Crosswire, Crosswire Bible Society Sword Utility, as well as the popular Bible Time, that's Qt, and Zephos, that's GTK, graphical user interfaces for it. Thanks not only to the loving labors of the ADJ, the Aprendiendo de Jesus team, but also the attention of uh, Mr. Stuart Henderson, um, S-T-H-E-N at OpenBSD, and Omar Polo, OP at OpenBSD, I've succeeded in having the Aprendiendo de Jesus port of SWORD, the core free software package for nearly all academic and other biblical studies, imported into the official OpenBSD ports tree as textproc slash SWORD. The GUI front ends for SWORD are much more complex, but at least having SWORD itself available with the simple command package add SWORD 
is proving to be one very modest piece to the puzzle of helping OpenBSD be as serious of a tool for us theologians as it is for you sysadmins, right? The flexibility is there because the machinery is already in place. Now, I look forward to talking with any or all of you in-person attendees in the hallway after the close of the session. And for online listeners, I welcome your later questions and comments via email. You, you can write to me. Uh, information is at my website, coreystephan.com. For everyone gathered in the here and now, of course, including anyone who might be in the IRC channel, let me open the floor. What questions or comments might you have? Please feel free to ask or talk about anything that you might like. Thank you very much, everybody. Yes, Mr. Ethan, right? Eli. Eli. Elijah, sorry. <laughs> Mm. That's a great question. So um, repeat the question for the record. That's the right thing to do. Okay, so the question is basically, is the kind of uh, uh, administrative structure and, 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 and the various things uh, that I've lauded in this talk about the OpenBSD project um, are, are these things um, in the way that the Summa Theologiae is supposed to be about uh, truth in an absolute sense. So for all people um, are the things that I've talked about for OpenBSD, should they be truth for all projects? Did I capture your question? All right, thank you, Mr. Elijah. Um, yeah, that's a really excellent question. Um, it's kind of, it's, it's one, um, it's one that I didn't consider uh, while working on the talk because I, you know, that the talk is about opening a, a set of conversations that have never been opened before, at all. I mean, uh, uh, I'm, um, it's not like the Vatican has a group of professional theologians talking about, you know, how to incorporate, you know, free software design ideas into <laughs> projects. <laughs> they could. Please hire me, <laughs> uh, but uh, but anyway. Um, so it's it's a, it's about opening a new conversation, though, right? Um, I I think that um, I, I I I think that as an initial answer, then in the context of this room for the recording, I can say two things. The first is um, the idea that orderliness as a whole is a primary objective and intelligibility for somebody to um, be able to pick up and learn the thing with the thing being documented for itself, with that also being a, a kind of core idea that's very much so like the Summa, right? You start in the first article, you can just read point to point with very minimal background knowledge is how it's meant to be done, right, in its historical context. I think that's a good thing for, for any modern software project to have. Um, uh, at the same time, some specifics, things like, you know, um, uh, having uh, the, the particular leadership pro uh, structure that the project has, um, or uh, decisions that are made in the name of what people in the project believe to be correct, you know, some of those things that I got into, that kind of uh, thorny debate that was suggested to me by a trusted person in IRC. Um, those sorts of things are going to um, perhaps necessarily be different in different projects. And um, there's probably a, a real good in having a diversity of those things in different projects. So that's just an initial answer. But I'm happy to hear thoughts from anybody, right? Opening the floor, opening discussion. I really appreciate the question, though. Thank you. Let's, let's start with here, uh, Mr. David. Um, jumped in. There was a talk yesterday where they were talking about um, BSDs uh, being used in war-torn environments and 
being secure in those environments. Mm, mm. Um, right now, the advantage goes to Linux there with, with organizations in the U.S. patching Linux to be more secure in those environments. Do you think there's an advantage in the orderliness uh, towards those environments? That's a great question. So actually, um, this makes me really glad that I made that little shout out to that um, to that project uh, that's that's uh, helped me in some real uh, uh, professional ways, the Aprendendo, Aprendendo de Jesus project. It's precisely about things like let's have an implementation where you know Spanish speakers in uh, contexts where they're low on security um, can just plug in an operating system and everything they need to learn about how to use it will just be a, a self-contained thing. Um, so there's security and there's self-contained learning all in one thing. And um, it's, it's precisely in part targeted for the kinds of contexts that you were, uh, were just asking about. I was just asked about the uh, benefits of the BSD operating system, uh, operating systems uh, kind of inherent orderliness and, and security. Uh, for war-torn areas and uh, areas, and for groups of people uh, living in 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 physical, literal insecurity. So, um, what do you think about that? <laughs> I've, I've always thought that one of our strengths, in addition to the orderliness, and maybe this is a type of orderliness, is that BSD is self-hosted mm. and strongly self-hosted, and then. Uh, at least a lot of the people I know in the community um, don't upgrade from binaries, they upgrade from source. Mm. Um, and that might have an effect on the, the ability to be secure and then upgrading from source, you, you have a little more security mm. than mm -hmm. binaries would. Mm. Mm. So the comment from, uh, from uh, David Gilbert was, was that um, the uh, uh, not too complicated ability um, across uh, multiple BSD projects to upgrade from uh, source trees um, present uh, might present persons with with a kind of elevated security. So a kind of elevated security might be built into that for people who are living in uh, physical insecure contexts. So um, thank you for that. I was just adding it to the record. <laughs> Other questions, comments, or snide remarks? Yes. Uh, I have something that's not necessarily directly relevant to the talk today, but just what we were talking about yesterday. And, uh, you might say as a professor of theology, your job is to think about, part of your job is to think about good and evil. Uh, I see on your website here, you've got a comment about that too. Uh, what advice would you have to technical people for making technology that uh, sort of optimized for good rather than evil. Mm, and, mm. Uh, yeah, yeah. So this is a great question. Um, how, do you, how do you know? Yeah. How would you, how do you know? People who you know, a lot of people think social media is not a net good for us, uh, but I don't think the people who made it set out to make something bad mm. just say that. Right? So we don't always know. So how do you know? And what advice do you have? So this is a great question. So, so for the record, the uh, the question that I just received is uh, basically um, coming from my professional context as a theologian, where I teach on matters pertaining to questions of, of good and evil. Uh, what what advice can I share with persons uh, in the world of developing computer technologies um, regarding? Uh, the use of those technologies for good and evil. So, um, and design, use and design, yeah. So, um, I think that there are a couple of things that can be said here. One thing that I think is, is actually um, important for intellectual property in general is to uh, avoid... Um, Needless lockdowns of that intellectual property. So, so you know things like um, Creative Commons licensed academic peer review publications, for example, I see as bringing a net good because then um, 
persons will have more access to information to make informed choices that are ultimately about good and bad. And so those sorts of things, of course, can, um, there's a correlation with, with the idea of uh, licensing code in such a way that it can be used for any, by anyone for any purpose, which is the exact language that, that um, is uh, in every uh, license file that uh, gets put out by the OpenBSD project team. Um, so, so, um, so in a, in a real way, that kind of full um, transparency and openness, although it, it does leave room for sinister end use cases, um, also leaves room for cases, uh, for usages that are good that the makers themselves might not even understand to be good or might not even possibly foresee. So there is something very real there. Um, now, as far as broader questions about designing uh, computer technologies uh, with good and evil, I guess I, I, I one thing that I can say is that I, um, I, as somebody who's in a department that is building a neoclassical curriculum, traditional liberal arts, um, I believe strongly in in a holistic education. That means, for example, that um, somebody like me who's a theologian is nevertheless uh, at least uh, conversant in some areas of, of mathematics or natural or physical sciences, right? I can at least be at BSD CAN, right? And talk with people about the projects you're working on, um, achieving that kind of threshold, right? And similarly, persons who might be, say, computer science majors, right? This classic major that a lot of folks in this room probably have, uh, it's important that they um, uh, are, have, have, have a kind of rounded um, education that starts at, at um, an early level and that we not be, uh, um, and that we, we look at education as being the way that ultimately we will um, discover truth about what choices are, are right and what choices are wrong in the very things that we make. Yes. I just wanted to add to the answer. I think it, it requires people to be good and evil. It requires that agency. And in terms of licensing, the way I like to say it, just take a look at Microsoft, Mac, West, Facebook. They're colonizers. That's what they do. Like that, that someone who uses Microsoft in the developing world, Microsoft is colonizing. In that case, whereas OpenBSD has the chance to say, well, here's the thing we made, but now, now it's yours and, and you do with it what you will. And we're here as a community to accept you back, which again, it's a very Christian thing. I, I used to colonize work, but I know that, <laughs> well, you said liberal and you're from Texas, so you're already saying Christian things. Um, but, um, I think that's the real difference in that it is the people who are good and evil. Um, and, and when you're talking about things, you see Facebook, it's a platform full of people, full of people who have shown themselves to be reasonably probably evil by anyone's standard. You know, the, the whole engagement algorithm is like promoting anger rather than, uh, you know, as a measure of engagement. And, you know, same with Microsoft, here's an operating system, but you're going to get your Western advertising is through it now. OpenBSD has a chance to, to change that and not be the colonizer in this case. Anyway. Thank you very much. Well, I think, um, I'm not sure, uh, where are we with the recording? I think we're exactly at the end of time. Okay. Well, in that case, uh, so the, the comment was, was the idea that um, permissive licenses might be, um, uh, make it so that software is not about colonizing. And so there's, there's an actual kind of um, ethical imperative to um, uh, make it so that when a person makes a product for another person, the point of that product is not about taking over something about the life of that other person. And this might touch upon something like social, well, maybe the originators of social media had not 
malicious intentions, but recent develops, developments in social media have overtly, overtly negative intentions, that the whole point is to use psychological research, so to use true research, but for the bad of addicting persons to things that are not real, right? To a virtual curated false persona and so on and so on. So there's, um, there's much to be said probably about this discussion about the idea of a kind of colonizing technological effect and how we might think of that in a, right? We would never accept, for example, a house that locks you, sell, you in the house once you've bought the house, right? And where the house itself spies on you and so on and so on, right? It would be a, it's a patently absurd thing. <laughs> right, but that's a patently absurd idea. Right? And the point of the house is to addict you to looking at the mirrors in the house or something, right? It's just, when you phrase it that way, it's a really kind of absurd thing. Yeah. Any other questions, comments, or snide remarks, or ought we end because we're at the end of time? Thank you for the unusual talk. Yep. Well, thank you all for listening to my unusual talk. I'll talk to you in the hallway.